The last lecture of this semester will be on autism spectrum disorders. There are a few different, there's a range of disorders that get couched under now autism spectrum disorders. Uh, a couple of people, maybe a few people between the two classes read the journal article that did this comparison of brain regions. Some were smaller, some were larger, some had um, differing less connectivity to other regions. Um, but the comparison was between autism and ADHD, and it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting article, it's a very interesting comparison, and I think I have mentioned both of these things run a bit in my family, and um, they are often comorbid with each other. They have some shared symptoms, but they are certainly distinguished from each other as well and so if you're at all interested that's a that's a great journal article so some of what i just said but with words on the screen and more clarified and more specific so um, autism spectrum disorders includes autism and there are varying levels of autism of how much um how strong the characteristics and symptoms are as well as how much intellectual disability there is, there's just a really wide range. And now autism spectrum disorders includes autism and what used to be called Asperger's syndrome. So if you look at the DSM-5, there's no longer Asperger's syndrome, um, which we used to call in the past was a kind of a um, highly functioning autism is, what, is how they kind of talk about it now. It also includes this pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. So it's sometimes really difficult to diagnose autism. Uh, if we have a um, developmental kind of language disorder, we see those kinds of language disorders in people with autism. It, it, ha it, it has some overlap with ADHD. It has some overlap with other um, psychological disorders and, and mental disabilities. So it, it can be tricky to um, diagnose it correctly. It is along a spectrum, so it includes people with varying degrees of difficulty. It ranges from relatively mild in these symptoms to very severe, and again, that, that mild to severe is how much it also is discussing how much potential intellectual disability there is, where some people don't have really any intellectual disability, and some of these people that we used to call them or say, that person has Asperger's, where now we're calling them, they have highly functioning autism spectrum disorder. Some of them are the, the scientists of the, of the world who are, who are in those fields where they can focus on their interests quite a bit and social and emotional interaction aren't necessarily the, the key parts of being successful in their field. It is much more common in boys than in girls. It's much more noticeable in boys than in girls, which I think makes it easier to diagnose. Uh, we have we had one person who was um, applying for a job here at the university, uh, and she was looking at uh, autism in girls, and it looks like there are lots of um, reasons why girls Girls typically have are, are better with language than boys, as and that stays sort of stable from when we're children through adulthood. And there's a lot of symbolic play with girls that we it might just be much more difficult to diagnose because it's relatively mild, because girls are do have better language skills and they have more symbolic play, which kind of masks that inability uh, to deal with the social and emotional interaction, whereas boys, because they have uh, worse language skills and because their play is really much more often surrounding objects and so forth, that, that it's more obvious that their interests are lying in these in these objects and in their, their individualistic activities instead of in the social, emotional kind of interactive world. While autism spectrum disorder used to be rarely diagnosed, it is much more commonly diagnosed today. So we can even just look at um, prevalence per 1,000 children um, in the year 2000, which was 6.7 children per 1,000, whereas in 2010, that estimate is about 14.7 children in every 1,000 children. 
uh, are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, why we're seeing this rise is unclear. Whether it, it, there is actually something environmental that has some influence or whether we've just understood it better and relaxed our criteria of diagnosis because they used to just this used to be called different things because we weren't diagnosing it correctly it's really not clear um, why we're seeing this rise in autism people with autism if we look at the symptoms they tend to have deficits in their um, social communication and social interaction and emotional exchange uh, there are several places in this book and i think others and in that in that article that talk about how um, they have a smaller amygdala and if you remember from back in the emotion chapter we're talking about the amygdala and how um, people with severe who were missing their amygdala tended to not look at the eyes at all so there there is that deficit there they have amygdala but they are smaller and um, they tend to not look at eyes as much for um, their kind of social attention and they tend to uh, not catch things they tend to not catch the kind of uh, social cues of of pointing and where people are looking and that kind of information that we get from social exchanges they also have deficits in uh, nonverbal communication both their understanding really of, of nonverbal communication as well as their ability to provide this kind of nonverbal communication to other people so making clear gestures that are meaningful where their body language is clear as well as facial expressions that are matching what their emotions are and what they're trying to say they tend to show some restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior interests or activities uh, some of this falls under the guise or falls under the term of stimming uh, if uh, i usually have some student able to come up and talk about their experience with uh, children with autism spectrum disorder as uh, there are more and more groups working to help people and that's that's one of the volunteer opportunities that i think is um, relatively open to college students but um, that stimming, that self-stimulating behavior uh, is often something where they are repeating something. Um, and sometimes that is a very innocent kind of thing. So I shadowed a woman who worked with autism, uh, autistic children for uh, a day. My sister shadowed one of her children for the entire school year. So each of these children had a shadow who and the she and the woman would have them in her classroom for a good part of the day and then um they would go off to be i don't want to call it mainstreamed but they would go into their own classrooms and they would work with a, an occupational counselor as well uh, but i i was following one of the kids and uh the occupational counselor allowed him to jump on a trampoline he, she had a small trampoline uh every time he would first when he came in to help calm himself down but then uh, he would do something right and she'd say you want to jump on the trampoline and he'd go jump on the trampoline so this is the self-stimulating behavior can be something that's really innocent and uh, like that like jumping on a trampoline or um, uh, playing with uh, getting really interested in, in a train or a truck or, or some something like that or or organizing uh, something it can be somewhat more uh, destructive in some ways sometimes they do some head slapping or things that we have to people have to stop them from from doing they tend to be resistant to change in routine um, and this is not to say that they aren't able to get out of schedule or do things that aren't in their routine but they typically like to be warned ahead of time they don't like to have these kind of surprises that are out of the outside of their routine they have some um, unusually weak or unusually strong responses to stimuli where they either um so one example is sometimes they can uh we can watch them it looks like they got very badly hurt and they don't even notice it so they have this really weak response to getting hit on the face and then but sometimes there are things that, that we typically habituate to that they don't habituate to so they have a really strong response to um the tags in their clothing or a particular smell or smells in general um, and they they really they don't handle those stimuli very well 
Okay, I have two slides discussing the causes of autism spectrum disorder, and I'm going to go ahead and say now that it's, I know I'm going to end out rambling or sounding very rambly just a little bit throughout this because it's really complicated and there's no easy answer and the suggestions and hypotheses are, are many. <laughs> and I could almost do the listing like I did with schizophrenia, but all of the textbooks tend to stay a little bit shorter with that, with that listing. But there are lots of different things going on. Uh, so first, I'm going to start by talking about infants with autism and how they make a normal amount of eye contact. At two months old, we see that eye contact decline over time. So if you remember talking about the amygdala in the emotion chapter, that the people who had their amygdala worn away completely, they um, tended to not make eye contact and they really missed out on the expression of fear because fear is really in the eyes. Um, and we see kids with autism, they do have smaller amygdala than quote normals. And so uh, which direction that's going as far as I'm not making eye contact and so I'm not developing developing my amygdala or whether my amygdala is, is not developing and so I'm not having eye contact. It's, it's not completely clear, but we see that piece of it. We also see um, there is a great deal of genetic influence but what this genetic influence is, is it's hard to say. There's not a single gene that anybody points to. I think your author talks about the dozen or so genes that appear to be most strongly linked with autism, and they explain about 5% of the cases. And it's suggested that um, there might be new uh, mutations and changes in genes that are... Um, showing a relationship to even more cases than than that. Uh, if you know about the research that is being done at the University of South Carolina, they are looking at Fragile X. So these are kids who have this particular gene and um, some of them have autism spectrum disorder and some of them do not. If they have Fragile X syndrome, we, it appears from what I understand, I don't sit in on enough of the of the research to really know, but it appears that there are differences in how those children behave and that they are making less eye contact, especially perhaps when they are made to feel a little bit uncomfortable. But there's no single gene and it looks like many, many genes linked to autism, kind of like what we saw with schizophrenia. And it looks like we are getting cases of um, new, muta new mutations of genes. And in some of these genes, what we're seeing is those micro deletions where there's just a little piece of gene that is missing and that that makes it more likely as well. Your author also mentions the importance of the prenatal environment and says, hey, doesn't this sound, doesn't this remind you just a bit of what we said about schizophrenia? Um, so if uh, pregnant mothers are exposed to large amounts of pesticides, solvents, perfumes, or air pollutants. They are more likely to have a child with autism spectrum disorder. And if a mother has a child with autism spectrum disorder and then has another child within 18 months, uh, that second child has a 14.4% of also having autism. Whereas if the second child comes along or the next child comes along after four years, uh, that chance drops down to 6.8%. So suggesting again, that really what's what's gonna be similar there is the prenatal environment because genetics, the genetics aren't gonna change um, or the chances for certain genetics aren't gonna change. It's gonna be the prenatal environment that is the most similar at those two different, at those two times that are close in time. He also has this um, example or this uh, interesting fact that uh, some mothers with of children with autism have antibodies that are attacking certain brain proteins. And um, if we look at children who don't have autism, few of those mothers had have those same antibodies. They did a study in monkeys where they injected the monkeys with antibodies either from these mothers um, who had these antibodies that attack the certain brain proteins or mothers who have children with autism versus injecting the monkeys with 
antibodies from mothers of children who do not have autism and whose antibodies do not attack these same brain proteins. And what they found was the monkeys that were injected with the antibodies from the mothers who had children with autism, so they had these antibodies that attack certain brain proteins, that those monkeys also had babies that um, tended to shy away from social contact, which was not true for the other group. It's the uh, quickest and dirt undirtiest way I could think of to say that. <laughs> it was kind of complicated. Um, prenatal nutrition is also important. So adequate amounts of folic acid or B9 uh, during pregnancy halves the risk of having an autistic child. If you are sitting in on my developmental class as well this semester, when we talked about prenatal environment and infancy, um, that folic acid was important for a great deal of our um, of having a healthy pregnancy. So there are some difference in brain structures and brain function in um, people with autism spectrum disorder. If they look at infants who are eventually diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, those infants have higher levels of circulating neurotrophins than other infants. If you remember, neurotrophins are what are keeping neurons alive after neurons are produced by the brain. And what's happening in um, early, early development is that we are producing too many neurons and the nervous system is then, um, some of those neurons are going to die from apoptosis really so that the healthier circuitry can survive and be more efficient and this appears it appears that more of these neurons are surviving and so there's some speculation about the overgrowth of the brain and then how some of the neurons that maybe should be coding for one sensory modality end up in another part of the brain uh, suggesting why they might do things like kind of um, hear and see and feel the lights and have some of those uh, sensitivities that they that they end up having some of that is speculation from this uh, these higher levels of um, circulating neurotrophins we see a larger head size at birth as it appears they have a larger brain uh, at birth and in infancy which again is, is could be because they have more neurons because the neurons are not dying off but it also could be due to uh, excess of cerebrospinal fluid and in fact the um, excess of cerebrospinal fluid appears to be uh, highly correlated with um, with the likelihood of having all of having autism spectrum disorder Another difference is that the mini columns in the prefrontal cortex are just different. We haven't really talked about the mini columns in the prefrontal cortex, but these are really, uh, these are columns that are representing the, the kind of um, smallest units of processing of what's going on in the prefrontal cortex. And while these mini columns in people with autism spectrum disorder have the same number of neurons within them, the mini columns there's reduced size between the mini columns themselves people think this might be an explanation for why they do get um very uh, why they analyze details and get in and start and look into those really um more while they get caught up in in some of their interests and get very focused in that way plus there are differences in the cerebellum the amygdala and the hippocampus. I've already talked about the amygdala now. It appears to be more the right amygdala than the left. We also see a likelihood of the right hippocampus being somewhat enlarged. And we also see some um, a smaller cerebellum. My One of my textbooks says the cerebellum is smaller, but my memory from that journal article, which it has been a couple years now since I've read that, or at least a year since I've read that, um, if I remember correctly, it was the connectivity between the cerebellum and, and other areas. I usually uh, tell some jokes about myself on, and my cerebellum, but I forgot to do that this semester. And But we do have some dyslexia in my family and serious attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And it appears we have some autism spectrum disorder as well. And um, we definitely have some damaged cerebellums in um, cerebella in, in, my, in my family. And my joke is usually because it's about the, the timing 
of um of activities you know and I, I play the piano very poorly and part of what's off on my piano playing is is not just that i don't practice that much but that my timing is just sometimes weird and off and i also usually do the thing of um i clean out my garden sometimes and i throw pine, pine cones over the fence to just get them out of my garden and sometimes because my timing is off with throw with the letting go of the pine cone sometimes it goes straight up in the air and sometimes it goes straight down to the ground it's kind of it's kind of humorous but um definitely some cerebellum damage in in pretty much everybody in my family if we look at the treatments for autism spectrum disorder there's no medical treatment for those central problems of um the decreased social behavior and communication their issues with uh, communication and interaction and really the uh, kind of repetitive or ritualistic sorts of behaviors are not very well medicated either there are a couple of antipsychotics that are used sometimes to reduce stereotyped behaviors and especially um, those self injurious behaviors so risperidone is an example of an antipsychotic that is sometimes uh, prescribed for people with autism spectrum disorder. It does have serious side effects um, in addition to uh, weight gain and, and lethargy. There are some other side effects that are that we have with those antipsychotics. Uh, interestingly, there are lots of off-label medications that are being prescribed to these people with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, one of the studies that has looked into this estimated that 35% of um, ASD children are on some kind of are on one off-label prescription at least one and nine percent of children are on three or more off-label prescribed drugs so um what's going on with that and sometimes it's antidepressants and a lot of times i think it's just to uh, allay some of the that got cut off on a previous semester so and i didn't finish all of this, but I think where I was going with that was that um, a lot of the medications are, I think they're often prescribed to handle some of the comorbid issues or problems that people with autism are handling. Things like depression, anxiety, ADHD, and other, other things that are uh, comorbid with autism, whether it's somewhat caused by the autism or um, whether it's just some some comorbid things that happen in the in the brain and in the, in the family and, and everything that's going on but I think it's really important to come to these behavioral treatments that are um, focusing on their what they are attending to and then reinforcing favorable be, favorable behaviors uh, applied behavioral analysis or ABA therapy is the most common behavioral treatment and usually this is where I have some student in the class who is working with one of these there are a few places around um, around the Midlands that are working with students or, or children with autism and most of them most of those places use some kind of ABA therapy where when I mean behavioral analysis it's more um, they are are analyzing the behavior of these children they are seeing what specific behaviors or whatever is can be reinforcing for this child and i used the example of jumping on a trampoline earlier and then what behaviors do we really need to stop do we really need to maybe find some punishment for or not pay attention to and then every time they they are doing something that is a favorable behavior making sure that we are um, reinforcing that right away with something that they either really enjoy doing or um, some food that they they really enjoy or, or something of that of that nature and it's applied behavioral analysis because they really are analyzing person by person or ch child by child what is going to help this person the most and i have this left over from that spring 2020 class where we all everything went online I didn't get to see anybody again but i will see you all on monday but this is the the end of um the lectures and i hope you all feel like you got a lot out of this and um i hope your semesters are ending up well but we will we will talk on monday and go over the review for the final
Take care and stay safe and have a great weekend.